dashing back and forth. At um, 8.41, Sergeant Paul Tapal joining us on the phone. Oh, so old-fashioned. <laughs> oh, God, so 20. And stay connected, stay connected. Right on. I apologize. I have uh, issues with my, uh, my, my data or, uh, you know, my data. Oh, you reached uh, your limit? Free. No, uh, I think there was a disruption in our service and our carrier, but, uh, you know, it's always good to stay connected. But, hey, good morning, man. Good, good morning, morning, everybody. Good morning, Sabrina, uh, Jason, Joe, sir, Chris. Morning. How you guys doing? Good morning, Sarge. Doing pretty good. Uh, Sarge, good good work with that uh, capture of that murder suspect uh, yesterday. Are you able to provide any uh, other details on it other than what was released? It's really, you know, we want to, first and foremost, you know, the Guam Police Department, we always regret, you know, reporting. Uh, there's always that, that hard feeling of reporting, you know, uh, tragic incidents and stuff, and it's really, it, it brings to mind, you know, the, the importance of life. and. On behalf of the, you know, our chief Stephen Ignacio, the men and women, our condolences always goes out to the family uh, that is always affected by these types of crimes. So, you know, as we reported from Sunday on to yesterday, you know, the death investigation led to the capture of 27-year-old John Richard Bass III in the Gihu area. He was subsequently charged for aggravated uh, murder, aggravated assault. Um, you know, possession and use of a deadly weapon and commission of a felony, uh, attempted murder, and, and, and so forth. So, you know, um, hopefully the arrest leads to a conviction with these charges. And, you know, we want to thank the community for really providing us with, uh, you know, a lot of information, giving us some known sightings and everything. And, you know, it just goes out to show the community stands behind each and every one of us, you know, every Guamanian that calls Guam home, you know, they, they, they since the onset of this, you know, people have been chiming in about how, you know, they can help and stuff and, you know, uh, simply just reporting any suspicious activity. And, you know, this, like I've always said, you know, crime, there's always that trickle effect. People do get affected by it. And, you know, luckily, you know, and unfortunately, you know, that the family members have to endure, but, you know, they're, they're not going to go through this alone. You know, we're, we're here to support. And our main goal with the Guam Police Department is to get, uh, gain that conviction so the family can, we can bring justice to the family. But again, thank you again to the community, the greater community for their patience, understanding, and their support in the, you know, the men and women of the Guam Police Department. Was it, um, Sarge, I heard that it was uh, a caller um, tip that um, included you guys in on the whereabouts of the suspect. Yes, yes, I forgot to mention that it was really, you know, the, the efforts of the community uh, that's why we want to, you know, commend the, the, the community, the greater community, because, you know, the information that they were sharing led our officers to the area. So, you know, again, thank you uh, to everybody. They understood what needed to be done. You know, we did put the wanted flyer out there. Our guys were burning the midnight oil. They worked the case straight through and, you know, following up on the leads, following up on the calls, the sightings, and, you know, we were able to um, pretty much get that, that, uh, you know, that single triangulation of where he's at and how we're going to, you know, uh, do it with the assistance from the community. So, again, thank you again to everybody. Yeah. Great. Uh, Paul, do you have any other information about this case, any specific details as to what happened um, at Hotel um, Mayana that led up to this incident? No, not at this time to uh, report out. Again, you know, um, our guys um, just, um, pretty much what was provided. Again, these guys worked through the, you know, since the onset. So um, they will provide more if the magistrate reports does come out before what we are going to release. You know, we can, uh, working closely with the AG's office, you know, we've, we've worked with securing the, the, the declaration of probable cause so that we can get the conviction. So the magistrate report should provide more information should it come out before any other additional release uh, that we're going to provide from the Guam Police Department. But again, you know, we, we try as always to protect the integrity of every investigation, the serious investigation such as this to bring uh, that conviction. So, you know, we're going to work with the AG's office on this part. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sorry, no, I wanted to ask because uh, we learned through the family that uh, the victim had reported him multiple times to the police. Are you aware of any history of this? And did you have any comment on, on it? Because some people are, are saying 
and commenting that this was a system failure. Not that I'm tracking of any report. I did read some, you know, some news articles and everything. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's really um, understanding how we can do our, our part, how we do our part with really, you know, the, the, um, and, 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 and of course, enforcing this. Um, I'm not tracking if any reports were made or, you know, the amount of reports that were made. So, um, the, you know, these are things that will be brought up um, when we move forward with, uh, you know, the, the trial in itself and, you know, uh, with the case moving forward. But, um, you know, I, I, if, if people have, you know, the greater community has any concerns in how officers respond to any type of domestic violence, you know, we at the Guam Police Department have moved for advocating for victims by developing our own domestic assault response team. And as a matter of fact, the uh, investigators that led this investigation are officers from, our detectives from our domestic assault response team. The department has also really, you know, worked with our advocates in ensuring that our advocates are properly trained, in ensuring that our advocates are properly equipped and not just dealing with, you know, survivors of domestic violence, but also working with survivors of sexual assault so the, the Guam Police Department works closely with other nonprofit organizations and government agencies. So the judiciary process in itself, if we effectuate an arrest, the arrest just doesn't stop there. Our advocates work behind the scenes with working with the victim and providing the justice. You know, whether to say that things may fall out, uh, you know, fall through the crack, it's really hard to gauge and track. But I do know that, you know, um, from the chief of police, uh, you know, to the management, we've assured that the services that we provide to the community are patrol officers which is you know i don't want to say it's basic report taking it's 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 mandated that we we apprise the victims of their rights so you know this is where it, we've taken domestic violence to a, you know, another level where we've we're working and apprising the victims now we call them survivors of their rights and what they you know they can um, achieve with you know going through issues with domestic violence and family violence cases. It really is um, a, a battle that we're seeing throughout the greater community in, in, in understanding how we deal with domestic violence. But the Guam Police Department has we have a working mechanism that's dedicated for this specific crime, for this these specific incidents. And I want to commend our dark. I want to commend uh, you know KOM. You guys were a part of it and, and seeing the transformation in providing that, you know, the outlet for the uh, victims of domestic violence and, um, you know, and sexual assault, the, the, our, our safe room that was donated by KUM and the, the, the sponsors was really, it's, you know, I visit that place and it's that, that setting away from the ugliness of what's happening is that, you know, we've partnered with, with various members of the community to assure the safety of the victims. So, be tracking, Chris, you know, to your question about how many complaints and everything. Mm -hmm. I don't have a tracker for that, but I just want to highlight about what our officers and what the Guam Police Department have in line that deals with domestic and sexual assault uh, cases. Paul, you said you're not you're not tracking it, um, you know, but, you know, a woman was murdered here and the family is coming forward saying that um, this is not the first time that, you know, they've experienced um, or have seen uh, Mr. Bass uh, exhibit these sort of, uh, you know, violent tendencies, right? So do you think maybe GPD should track this? Maybe GPD should know when they're responding to incidents like this or calls for help from, from survivors or victims, that they should know who they're dealing with? I mean, if you get a name, hey, you know, so-and-so, he's beating up on my mom, wouldn't GPD look up in their system. Okay, we know this person has uh, has ha we've had complaints about him in the past. Uh, this, per this person isn't that has, something yeah. that you guys do before you go to a scene or to a call where someone needs help. So initially, in the initial response, right from a patrol level, we have we have the the, uh, the data information that's available to us. We punch up the and everything, right? And people. Uh, you know, we, we need to understand the primary role, right? We are the first responders. We uh, build and, of course, entertain and, of course, report incidents of crimes that occurred. So, you know, speaking of domestic violence, where it goes after that, it's really 
and, and understanding the mechanism that the Guam Police Department has, we don't just arrest, you know, the perpetrator, but we also provide assistance with, uh, to the, um, um, what do you call that, uh, the, the survivors, whether it be a domestic violence case or a sexual assault case. The judiciary process in itself takes its course once we take it to magistrate and everything, and there's the courts issue an injunction, uh, separation, restraining order, uh, temporary restraining orders, and so forth. They move forward in, in providing assistance to the victim. So there's a whole mechanism in play, and there's always that, uh, that, that ability to share information, whether it's a repeat offense, whether it's uh, continuous calls. Nonetheless, we still have to entertain it in, 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 in the, the call in itself, and of course, report the incident, whether we arrest them one time, whether you, we arrested an individual four or five times. We are just going to keep doing our, our process in providing this information, whether it's habitual. Maybe we need to look at the bigger uh, spectrum of what we need to do to assure that we break the cycle. And that's always been our model of our domestic assault response and is to really end the violence and break, breaking that cycle of violence. How are we able to do that? We can't just do it with an enforcement process. We also need to get our nonprofit organizations involved. We also need to get uh, you know, our, our multi-agencies that the government provides involved with this because where it stops with GPD, it's really, um, people just think it's there, but we also have our advocates to check with the survivors to see how they're doing, to see what we can do to help. You know, many years ago, we had a, a program initiative with the coalition, Project Hope, where we provided, you know, GPA, uh, provided funds for, for our survivors so that they can reach out to our advocates, they can reach out to the services that the you know the courts have, they can reach out to see where the courts, where the, the process of the trial is going and everything because it's a long process and you know our part in what we do is the primary phase and everything it initiates the safety of the victim or the survivors by first separating the violent offender and hopefully getting him incarcerated, him or her incarcerated, and providing the safety net for the survivors. So, I mean the process in itself from how do we deal with this? It, it, you know, GPD's role is really being able to author, report, and to gain that, that conviction so that we can provide the safety here on out. Now, how do we deal with um, habitual cases such as this, right? Uh, different cases that may present as a, as a repeat offender. It's going to take a full spectrum of everything that everybody works for. You, you, you've met the coalition, um, their, their advocacy towards the survivor. What do we do now to bring um, Healing. How do we how do we do that if if you know we want to be able to break the cycle because it's it's, it's a tedious task and you know um, we do have the resources that are available to us to say that they, they have priors and everything that'll be annotated and that'll be able to re, uh, be brought forth in the court and hopefully that mm -hmm. when they go to the right. well, they, are you aware does he now she this woman Virginia she was murdered on Sunday can you say right now does Mr Bass have a record. I don't. I don't have. I don't have information of that. Um, I know um, the book was reported in the media. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not tracking his personal uh, arrest record or anything, or his previous arrest. Is there, is there an issue, Sarge, with the the courts and the information they may have on somebody uh, versus GPD and the information you guys might have in responding to a call? I mean, do you guys have systems that? kind of talk to each other where you have responding yeah. officers roll up on a scene and they're like, oh, this guy, uh, he's had, you know, three restraining orders against him. You know, there was some charges, so you just be mindful of rolling in. Because it kind of sounds like there's there's not communication where you guys don't know what the right doesn't know what the left is doing. But we do have, we do have that information sharing ability. Now, like I said, right, it's, it's okay, now we're responding to repeat offenders. What, 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 what is the, 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 what are we looking at, right? Are they habitually committing the same crime? We'll, we'll, switch, we'll switch gears, right? Um, those that are suffering to addiction, how many times have they been arrested? It will show he's had priors, he's been arrested, he's been adjudicated, this, how many times is, the, you know, the system will pop up. And of course, this is a network information sharing or information sharing with the respective um, agency. So we do have that in play. We do have uh, these things, but it's the individual in itself. What are we doing, you know, as a, uh, you know, I mean, we can, we can, we just arrested you two weeks ago. What are you doing out? You know, that may be the mentality of the officer. I just had a run in with this individual and yeah. we're back at the same call. It's, it's just, 
you know, the cycle repeats itself. When we just look at domestic violence, but if we transition into addiction, those that are suffering to addiction, what are we doing to help these types of, uh, you know, issues with crime? So understanding, please, you know, and I want to be specifically clear, our job is to report, our job is to uh, respond and report, and of course, determine probable cause and look into the safety of those that are going through either domestic violence or sexual assault. We provide the advocacy for that. Where we go from there, when we testify, we go into the courts, and our goal is once we make an arrest, is to obtain that conviction. The process in itself, it really falls into the next layer of the judiciary process. What is the sentencing hearing? What is they going to do for conviction? How are they going to separate? Do we work at bringing the family back together? Do we work at rehabilitation? That's in a process that the Guam Police Department is not a part of because we are the, the, the preliminary or the primary stage of every investigation. And once we once we get that conviction, we testify, we work with the Office of the Attorney General in getting that conviction. When we move forward, it's really, like I said, we are in the primary or the preliminary state of every case or every, every investigation. I, I, I get it, Paul. I, I mean... I, we see it in the magistrate's complaints. Sometimes the names are familiar. They go in for family violence. Yeah. Then maybe like a week later, there there's another magistrate's complaint for family violence. So it's just like this cycle that keeps on going and going and going and moves from one victim to another victim. And how does it end? And it needs exactly. to stop. And that's where that's where we work. And if you've, if you've seen the work that the Guam Police Department has done in the past, you know, KUM has been really supportive in bringing these information out, the services is there. Our main is really, how do you break the cycle? How do you end the violence? How do you end the cycle of violence with that's, that's happening within this? It's very dynamic. Domestic violence, family violence is very unique and dynamic. And, you know, within the Pacific region, we work closely with the Pacific Islands of Chief of Police. We work closely with them in monitoring this. The Pacific region is, is, is domestic violence, other than, you know, drunken behavior, is like the number one crime that's committed because of the fact that we're culturally binded, we're culturally uh, sensitive to different things. We may be that, don't say anything. I don't want you to bring shame to the family. Um, this is where advocacy comes in. This is where outreach is coming. This is where the, the coalition, this is where the not, this is where the community and the stuff comes in because we want to be able to empower the survivors that you're not alone in this. You have the strength to stand and you have the support. And, you know, we only do the preliminary state of the investigation, but I tell you the legwork that our advocates do in following up and ensuring the safety, ensuring how they're doing the well-being of the, every survivor in every case, this is what we bring over domestic assault response. But how do we end the cycle? That's the magic question. How do we bring an end to the cycle of violence that happens with any domestic or family violence case? It's really, mm -hmm. you know, this, this, the mm -hmm. specific studies that we've been working with there's mm -hmm. always been, you know, that that's always going to be hitting high frequency in domestic violence within the Pacific region. Right. And, you know, Paul, that's why I get very emotional about it, because, like as you said, KUAM has partnered with the Guam Police Department. We've had on Cynthia Cabot numerous times. Uh, it was just a domestic violence uh, awareness month awareness. last month, I believe, and when we had uh, Cynthia on. So that's why it's so frustrating to hear about cases like this where there was a survivor who reached out for help. The family was reaching out for help. I mean, there was a, a known history um, of this person committing violent acts. And so that's why it just, I just get really upset that here we are today, you know, hearing about a woman who was murdered because of family violence. Yeah. Anyway, I could go on and I could get really upset about it, but I'm sure whoever our next guest is will probably have a lot to say. But Paul, just real quickly, any update on Jerry's Kitchen? They're open. Hello? They're open? No. The, I'm talking I'm about the investigation into the police officers or the un, uh, or oh, the that's still ongoing. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. If it's an open case, that's still ongoing. That's, okay. you know, um, the... The AGs have moved forward with the findings that was provided by uh, the Iranian investigation by um, our officers, uh, our, our traffic investigators from uh, GPD's Highway, Highway Patrol uh, Division, and of course the uh, uh, investigators from the Office of the Attorney General. Based on those findings, they moved forward with a criminal proceeding. Um, we've opened up, uh, Chief Ignacio has uh, opened up uh, administrative investigation for the officers 
that were involved in this case, both the investigatory side and, of course, the uh, off-duty officer that was present at the time. So this is a still uh, this is an ongoing um, administrative investigation from the Brown Police Department. Then, and of course, I can't really expound on the uh, criminal as uh, investigation from the office of the attorney general. But again, this was again uh, Chief Stephen Ignacio ensuring the transparency that we keep the community informed uh, of where we're going with the, the investigation. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I just remembered something uh, back to Mr. Bass. Uh, was there any uh, truth that he was sent to the hospital after he was captured? I didn't receive any information. Like I said, those guys worked, you know, they burned the midnight oil with this case. So um, all I got was the uh, tracking uh, documents of him, his arrest record, and of course his, uh, uh, his processing or his booking records and uh, mm -hmm. working with the, the uh, confinement at Department of Corrections. Mm -hmm. um, also, just I wanted to ask about, you know, he seemed like he was on the run for quite a long time. Um, I'm hearing that there were several people that uh, spotted him and it was reported uh, and that officers saw him in the jungle. Why weren't the dogs deployed? Our dogs, uh, that's it. our dogs are specific for various tasks, uh, drug detection. Um, our dogs are also for um, bomb and, of course, you know, uh, uh, anti-terrorist um, effect, but more more of a drug detection uh, canine. Mm. So specifically okay. for sticking the dogs after them, you know, we can't just say sick and boy. <laughs> we, you know, it's, they're they're bred and trained for specific tasks such as drug detection and of course uh, bomb um, bomb and explosive detection. So um, having them scour into the jungles and everything, it's a greater risk to the dog in itself, uh, and of course. Um, the, the, the work that entails for the specific 14 dogs that's assigned to the handler, it's not gonna, it's not conducive to what the environment it has. Are you able to say, Sarge, because uh, when on the video, it looks like his clothing is, is uh, well, it's pretty torn up. Was that something that happened during the alleged crime or in the apprehension of the suspect? I, I don't know, sir. I won't be able to answer that. I don't have any information as to that. That's uh, based, that's what's circulating mm -hmm. on social media, so I don't know. Um, like Dana, uh, Bacassi, I, I won't be able to, you know, really give a definite answer to that. Right. Okay, Sarge. Roger. You good, Bree? Uh, um, any results from drug tests? I. Uh, know that the last report that chief ignacia provided was that we're we're doing good uh, there was no uh, there was nothing of concern i don't know the numbers i can't really give a definite number because i want to you know provide of course the understanding and transparency of what we're doing um okay so then did anybody test positive that you know of so far not that we're tracking no okay all right <laughs> Uh, Sarge, one just, that's we don't want to score high on. Right, yeah. Just real quick on Project U because we know that it was uh, tabled because of a positive COVID case last week. Is there a status update on on this program? Yes. Uh, so we, because of uh, majority of our um, our youth our youth mentors have been inoculated, uh, we were tested um, yesterday. So that will bring us to day six. And the good news is that everybody that was a uh, um, a part of that has been cleared uh, with a negative test, but we're still erring on the side of caution. We're just going to, you know, go ahead and tell work from home for an additional three to four days, and we're going to test again to assure, but uh, that's a good thing. We still need to wait for the 14-day quarantine for the participants, and in doing so, we're moving forward in a relaunch effort, and we'll provide more and anticipating uh, that maybe by next week and um, bringing forward the uh, program. Uh, the full length of the program back to the, the, the participants because of this interruption. But um, we're working closely with Department of Public Health and Social Services. We're working closely with our safe school partners. And of course, you know, our, our the people that are making this possible, our participants and their family members, you know, our mentors call them on a daily basis, you know, finding, checking up on them and stuff. So once they, because they have to hit the 14A because uh, majority, you know, the issue of um, who has not been inoculated, um, they have to wait for that 14-day quarantine so that they can actually test out or shoot any signs and symptoms. So we're tracking that there's no, um, nobody's indicating any signs and symptoms or anything manifested uh, as a result of the exposure. So we're keeping our fingers crossed, we're staying prayers, you know, keeping everybody in our prayers and uh, 
hopefully by next week we'll be able to come up with a relaunch and uh, we'll, you know, we'll be more than happy to invite um, you know our media partners such as KOM to see the kids again. Uh, you know, this, this is something in which we're we're really working, and you know, it's 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 unfortunate, it's a setback, but you know, we got to keep things to truck forward and and move on and provide this you know platform for the community. Thank you, Sarge. Thanks, Paul. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you, guys. Thank yeah. you, guys, for the dialogue. I think you know, if I may, these are the questions that we do need to ask. We and um, you know, um, KUM has been a part of this. You know, you guys, we've we've gone into domestic violence. We've gone into you know dealing with addiction and crime in itself. So please continue to keep asking the questions about how we can better our community and you know what are the resources that are out there. So the the survivors that are listening, they can understand and they know that they're not alone in this. And there are people that are willing to help. There are organizations that are there to provide assistance. So thank you for that. I greatly appreciate that. All right, Paul. All right, Sarge. Yeah, yeah Bree, I mean, you, you raised uh, so many uh, good points, and it, it just, I think for some people, it's hard to tell, like, what the courts are responsible mm -hmm. for.